So what else has been driving my car? This is snow. There we are. That's better. How are you? No uh, CCTV today, I'm afraid. Because I've left the chip at work. So if I have a crash, I'll have no record of that either. Now you can't see, but I'm going to go right. I'm going to go the slow way. Because that fast way is flooded. Because we've been having done nothing but rain. Rain, rain, rain. You can hear it. Well, you can't hear it. I'll tell you why you can't hear it, because I've got to... Uh, no. You can't hear it because I've got uh, in DaVinci Resolve, which is my preferred editing software of choice, they've just brought out a thing called voice isolation. And it literally is like a reverse karaoke. It just gives you the voice and removes all the background noise. So it analyzes my voice and then uh, just ignores everything else. Which is great, isn't it? Thinking of getting one for the rest of my family. And then they like, finally, finally listen to what I'm trying to say. Ah, that's an old joke. That's a... Uh, but Jack, you often hear in wedding speeches where the father of the bride gets up and he said, I'm delighted to be able to talk to you today because, uh, you know, for once in my life, I'm actually just talking and everyone's got to listen. And uh, every, almost every father of the bride does that joke. And they all think that they've thought it up and it's highly hilarious and amusing and original and who faints. It's just every father of the bride speech has got that joke in it. So how are you anyway? Who are you? Who are you? This is more to the point. Never mind how are you. I was, um, I upload my videos onto YouTube, as you know, and uh, they're completely benign and of no use to anybody outside uh, almost, you know, uh, my target audience of, one, which is me, I can't imagine anyone would want to watch them, and um, and yet they're starting to get views of 40 and 50 viewers, which is, you know, I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, I know people have, uh, what are you doing, we're all in the shop, you know, on YouTube, I mean, you know, sometimes people have four or five thousand views, or... 40, 50,000, and some people even have more than that. They've got all like one million followers and all that, but I don't, I don't, I don't do this to get followers. I don't like for, I don't want people following me. Stop following me. Weird. It is weird, actually. You know, you do a video on, like I did one on immigrant dentistry. I know, possibly because it had the word immigrant in it, I don't know. But, uh, got 51 views, which is nothing. I mean, really, I don't even know why YouTube afford me the, uh, the, the, the facility to upload my stuff to YouTube and, and have it stored on their servers and broadcast internationally for the 51, for an audience of 51. I mean, for a sort of a regional postgraduate meeting, 51's probably not a bad audience, is it? But, uh, you know, for me, an audience of 51 is, is pretty good. But on the other hand, when you don't know, when you don't know who those 51 people are, when you're, it's like the squid game, you know, they've all got masks on. And they're all sitting in the audience, all with masks on, and you're looking around and you're thinking, oh, these people are all listening to what I'm saying, and, you know, probably 30 of them are from the General Dental Council, I'd imagine, uh, you know, looking for uh, ways to get me struck off. But 
when everyone's anonymous like that, it's, it's a bit disconcerting. So I would just like to say the opposite of what everyone else says. So don't subscribe, don't like, and don't press the reminder button. Do not smash that bell. Because <laughs> everybody who needs to know about these podcasts already needs to know about them. But it's a niche market. It's a very niche market. Mainly, I do this for the purpose of uh, waiting until computer software has got to the point where it can do pretty perfect uh, speech transcription. And uh, then what I'll do is I'll transcribe all 300 videos and I'll try and sort them out into some sort of book. Uh, which I will never will do, but I mean, you know, it's a thousand years. Someone's going to recognise that I am the Aristotle of the 2020s. The, uh, the Pythagoras. But of dentistry. <laughs> oh, well. Or, you know, maybe my great grandchildren will find it interesting to have a somewhat one sided conversation with their great 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 grandfather. It'll be long gone by then. <clears throat> or perhaps YouTube will uh, write around and say, we're going to charge you a pound a year for every video you've got hosted on the service. And, uh, and you know, we want £300 a year off you, in which case I'll, I'll say, all right, then take them all down. So they'll, they'll delete them all. Nothing more ephemeral, is there, than digital data. It's one format away from oblivion. And uh, and I'll think, oh, well, I've got them on my NAS, my net network storage. So, you know, they're going to live on. But um, which a lot of YouTubers don't. They don't save them, you know, especially if they're live streaming. They don't save copies of what they've done. And so when YouTube deletes their channel, then they are in serious trouble, you know, because it's quite difficult to download everything you've uploaded to YouTube when you start getting past the 250 hour mark. Let me just get rid of this. It's my latest box of goodies. It's a box of springs. I bought a box of nuts and bolts. And I liked it so much, I bought a box of uh, rubber O-rings. And then I like that so much, I bought a box of um, springs. So now, because you never know when you're going to need a little spring, do you? Little spring in your garden equipment. Little spring inside your torch. Little spring inside your step. Yeah, so that's... Uh, so, yeah, so the old... Um, I've started posting a load of videos from 2018, believe it or not, and some from 2017. Because I've got this uh, new computer, and there's, I've really... I put a lot of work in the last couple of months into learning how to use this video software. Um, and it's all basic stuff, you know, I mean, like real like stuff you'd learn on the first day of a course. It's all about fading stuff in, fading stuff out. Uh, mostly sound. A lot of sound. <clears throat> stuff I knew already because I've already, I've done podcasts for a long time, so I know about uh, compression. I know about uh, equalization and uh, uh, well, I mean, you know, sound sounds a bit of a neglected uh, art form. I think the trouble is that people think that the uh, picture is, uh, you know, what people want to see and they want to see a nice picture. And then if the sounds a bit crappy, uh, people don't care too much but in fact it's exact opposite um as long as the sound is crystal clear people will carry on watching stuff even if the picture quality is not that brilliant because you get a lot of the uh, value out of a broadcast comes out of the sound what people are saying the fact that you can see them is a bonus uh, but in fact from you know minute to minute and hour to hour people don't really change much in terms of their appearance so i suppose it does depend on the sort of video you're doing you know if you're televising a football match 
then it is nice to have pictures as well as, uh, you know, it's better than just listening to it being described on the radio. But having said that, most podcasts are not visual, are they? Not a visual event. They're just uh, an exchange of ideas. One way exchange of ideas. So you have to make sure the sound is great. And uh, we're now, you know, since COVID and everyone working from home, and uh, the, the broadcast media, which used to have like a superb record, you know, of uh, standards. In terms of quality, and they used to send their uh, broadcast cars round and interview people. And, and now everyone's trying to do it on Zoom or uh, on their laptop, you know, looking up their nose or... Uh, with, with no lighting, just a window behind them or a window shining on one side of their face or something. And they they don't have even an Ethernet connection. Their, their internet connection is rubbish. Their broadband connection is rubbish. And then they don't even have an Ethernet connection from their laptop to the uh, router because, I mean, who, what, you know, normie has a laptop and then keeps it plugged in an Ethernet cable. Surely the whole point of having a laptop is that, um, you know, it's on the Wi-Fi and you can wander around with it. But no, if you're going to do a broadcast interview, you've got to get a hardwired connection to, the, to, your, to, your, to your crappy broadband. Otherwise, uh, what'll happen is Julia Hartley Brewer or whoever will just, after two seconds, and it happened this morning, uh, with an ex-government minister and she'll just say, I'm sorry, the line is just too rubbish. I apologise to you and I apologise to the viewers. I'm just going to cut you off. I mean, OK, I, I can appreciate apologising to someone for cutting them off. But you shouldn't apologise to someone who's hasn't got the first clue about how to set up a laptop in a way that doesn't cut out all the time. You know, really, it's not it's not acceptable. I mean, your average mobile phone now is going to do a better job of uh, broadcasting broadcasting quality uh, than uh, than the laptop. Anyway, so yeah, so I mean, you know, it's miserable. Mini's just shot past me at ninety miles an hour when it's uh, it's pouring absolutely. Pouring. The roads are saturated. There are so many videos on YouTube of cars crashing. And it starts off with a picture of a road that's absolutely saturated with water. And then along comes a car driving 80 miles an hour. And it's going around a bend. And you think, OK, a hydroplane coming up, hydroplane. And sure enough, off it goes. And yet people don't learn. I mean, I think speed limits are too low anyway, certainly when it's warm and dry and there's not much traffic on the road but to drive to continue to drive 80 miles an hour when it's chucking it down really just you're not respecting the laws of physics you know as scotty would say you cannot change the laws of physics captain and that's what they're doing so it's quite funny listening to uh, myself in 2018 you know, it's like, it really is. I mean, one, one of the ones I've just uploaded, I was talking about how we were only booked up four sessions a week and not even fully booked, possibly three and a half sessions a week. And that was about the time that we got rid of our, uh, we, we made the receptionist job redundant. Remember, you never say that you're making the person redundant. You make the job redundant. And then the person just gets redundantized with them. But uh, no, the um, we had a receptionist who worked for the practice before I bought it, and pretty well, you know, thought that she owned it and it was her practice, and and even if she didn't, that uh, I should be running it her way because she knew how it should be run. And um, 
and uh, she thought she was my boss. And she's still working in dentistry, by the way. She's still working uh, in a local practice, not, not too far away. And they've got a thing on their website saying how lucky they are to have her. And I said, um, actually, uh, I said to the staff yesterday how lucky we were to get rid of her. Because she uh, embarked upon this campaign of passive resistance, which included writing all the notes in uppercase and writing all the patient's details in the computer system in uppercase. So when it came out, my dear Janet, Janet was all in uppercase. And I, and I kept saying to her, and also, you know, I mean, that I could go on for 20 minutes about the stuff she did. She used to, uh, I asked everyone not to double lock the doors because it was annoying if you unlocked the door once and then tried the handle and you couldn't get in. So I said, can we all agree just to single lock the doors? But, you know, there's no point double locking the door if you're going out to the toilet. So, but she, uh, because it was a thing that she could get, she could do and knew that the chances of getting detected doing it was zero, pretty much. Couldn't get caught in the act. That, uh, so she double locked all the doors because she knew it was frustrating for me to just unlock the door thinking that people will have done what I asked them to do and then try to handle and then find the door still locked. And that was that, it was that petty, you know. But her idea that we could trace it back to her was uh, was dumb. Because it was obviously it was her. Do you know what I mean? We, we knew. This is, we're not a massive corporation. We're not Marvel Suspensers. There were only about three members of staff. We knew who was doing what. And uh, she... Um, didn't really know how to work the recall system on the computer. So what happened was she um, used to ring all the patients up. So she used to send them an email and then uh, send them an email asking why they haven't uh, responded to the email and then ring them up and a week before just to confirm that they were coming in and then ring them up the day before to ask them why uh, they hadn't had their phone turned on and could they just confirm again that they were coming in. And then when I came in, I set the recall system up in the way it's supposed to, which is basically you can send them an email and then a, an SMS. But she was still doing this. Um, she was still doing this, ringing everybody four times. And people were saying, um, we don't want this. No, we don't want to be constantly, uh, are you coming in? Are you definitely coming in? Are you sure you're coming in? You know, because that, that was a problem. I, I mean, I understand she, she used to argue that uh, it was um, to make sure everyone came in and then nobody forgot their appointment and that we didn't lose any money from people not showing. But in fact, uh, it, annoyed, it just annoyed everybody. The uh, no-show problem was um, sorted out by getting everyone to pay two days in advance of their appointment or or allow us to rebook it you know so that gave everybody a lot more flexibility they could decide as late as two days before the appointment whether they wanted to come in for it or not and if they didn't then they could either cancel it or just not pay the invoice and we would reallocate the time no questions asked you know no money lost um so that that solved that problem just pestering them with phone calls all the time didn't I mean, okay, perhaps some people liked it, but the majority found it annoying. But the point was, it, it you know, it took a ton of time. It was busy work. It was stuff, um, it was like in the old days when you used to have to send off all your paper claims to the NHS. And um, the staff used to write details of every claim in a book called the finished book, because it was the treatment that was finished. And uh, they would put down the patient's name, date of birth, when the course started, when it was finished, and then how much um, we, money we were expecting. And um, then they put all the claims in an envelope, post them off, and then at the end of the month, they would get the schedules through, and the schedule would have, uh, again, the patient's name and how much was paid. And they would check the, uh, the, the what had been paid against the finished book, and make sure that we'd been paid for everything. Now. 
Now, the problem of Foss had, the dental estimates board or the dental practice board was very reliable. And in years that I worked on the NHS, probably 20 years or so, they never lost a single claim. They never, ever paid us a penny less than they were supposed to. We had plenty of problems, but the DEB or the DPB not paying our claims. Now, now the big problem was that, um, you know, supposing, because there, there, there might, in, in every envelope, there might be, uh, then there could have been a thousand pounds worth of, in those days of, of claims. And if an envelope got lost in the post and wasn't received by the DPB, then you were in the shit because you got all those signatures on, on, you know, like 200 pieces of paper all filled in, all signed. Don't forget in those days there was no computers, so it was all done from card records. How could you reconstitute that claim, you know? But, but they never did. They never did. It was very reliable. And basically when I got my own practice, I said to the staff, we're going to abolish the finish book. And they're like, what? Oh, abolish the finish book? But, you know, that's like, it takes half our day to do the finish book. And I'm, yeah, that's because in all my time working on the NHS, they've not ever lost one claim, let alone one envelope full of claims. Now, that was, it was a bit of a leap of faith because, uh, you know, you might say, oh, well, why didn't you run them all through the scanner? Or why didn't you photocopy them all? Well, because we did have photocopiers, but they were very expensive. And... We didn't have scanners. No, you couldn't digitize stuff. There were some, there were some little hand scanners and stuff like that. So, I mean, you could have, I suppose you could have. The, the, the equation was that the amount of staff time that was devoted to completing this finished book was out of all proportion to the risk of losing any money through uh, claims getting lost. It was just a total write-off. And so I said to them, we're going to put a stop to it. You're going to have to forget the finished book and go on and do something more useful instead. So, half of her day was, um, you know, involved with um, just uh, bringing the patients up and having a little chat, you know, just, uh, you know. Is that still all right Thursday, you know, how's everybody? And um, then we had two people leave, um, three if you include the owner who left uh, under a bit of a cloud two or three years later, two years later. But um, there's these, all these videos relate to that period, you see, so it's bringing it all back, it's painful memories. <laughs> Things I've forgotten and I wish I hadn't, you know, problems I had with the hygienist because she was like... Uh, mucking the patients about and then insisting that it's the receptionist's job to tell them that they were being mucked about and take all the flack, even though it was her that was at fault and it was her that was causing the chaos uh, on the basis that she paid me you know, part of what her, her income, you know, from her practice, which she thought she owned, was being paid towards me to go towards the receptionist and therefore the receptionist should be making these phone calls and completely missing the point that it was the mucking about I was getting upset, not the fact that she was asking receptions to make phone calls. That was that was fine, but we lost a, one uh, associate went to work somewhere else and I uh, strongly suspect that this uh, receptionist was uh, actively engaged in referring patients to this second practice where the associate had gone in the, so that they, you know, could uh, continue their treatment there. And um, then uh, we lost the hygienist because I think she was sort of half got fed up of working for me and half got poached. And um, I think mainly because, you know, patient numbers were falling because this uh, receptionist was actively sending our patients elsewhere. And um, and so as a result, the um, amount of work available for the hygienist went down. So the hygienist then jumped ship to work at this other practice as well. 
And um, then we got another hygienist in who mucked the patients about and, you know, decided to go home when she had patients still booked um, that day. And um, and so that that was, you know, it just came to the point. And it, and it was well past the point at that point, you know. I mean, I should have uh, done something about this probably a year earlier uh, when, when she started vanishing outside with the patients into the waiting room and started discussing with them. And I was saying, what are you discussing? And she was just saying, oh, we were just having a chat, you know. Where for all I know, she was handing out maps and making appointments for them at, this, at the other surgery. So it was, a, it was an unhappy time. And we got rid of her at, at an enormous cost. But... Um, uh, Probably the biggest cost was the business we lost because of what she did, you know, the way, the way that she um, manipulated the practice as if she owned it, while at the same time drawing a salary and you know and earning the same whether it did well or badly. This is a problem. Although um, you know you, you can only push it so far. I think the problem was that she didn't realise that if she pushed it too far, then there wouldn't be any money to pay her salary. Therefore, her job will get made redundant, which is what happened. You know, so she sort of um, unjobbed herself in the end. Oh, I don't know whether she was bright enough to realise that that's what she was doing, but she was. Uh, I don't know whether she, she possibly thought that um, we would we would keep her on, you know, um, whatever, because she was had. She thought she had security of tenure, and I don't think anybody has security of tenure. And uh, these people that are working at this other practice <laughs> are, you know, they've all got jobs with this other. But they've never ever asked me for a reference, and that's very unusual. You know, I mean, almost always when a member of staff leaves you, at some point someone's going to ask you for a reference, and uh, they are um, uh, they are the only people I probably wouldn't give a good reference to, because I don't believe they acted in the best interest of the business. I thought they were underperformers. I thought they were slow to learn. They were um, uh, deliberately you know uh, obstructive and stuff like that and i'll be i would be and you can put that sort of stuff in uh, a reference uh, providing that you can substantiate it you know providing that it's it's not done maliciously if it's you know if there's a if it's true then it can go in a reference uh, which is why nobody asked no, no, none of other staff have been and gone and asked me for references and i've given them good references but for those two you know won't ever ask me for a reference and I won't ever give them one so which says a lot about how they behave when they worked here not the fact that I won't give them one but the fact that they they've never asked for one they've never asked for one because they know what it would say you know what I mean they know what it would say okay lovely I'll um put my chip in the uh what's it now we've got to work without having a crash didn't I anyway goodbye to all 51 of you whoever you are cheerio bye I don't want to go viral. Don't make me viral. Bye.